I'm not sure about you, but I just feel like I'm swimming in the spirit. I've been so blessed today. Have you been blessed? Amen. I, I sense that some miracles happened today, and I've heard about some. And uh, I just thought this evening I had, a, I had a, a couple of points I wanted to share. I, I wanted to also maybe have a little bit of time of prayer if people wanted to come for special prayer to come down the front. We can do that, and if we have some time left over, we can do some Q&A. How does that sound? Does that sound all right? Uh, but before that, well, I want to pray, and then I want to ask uh, Sister Sharina to come up and just share something with us, because she just blew me away. So, <laughs> But let's kneel and pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, what a joy it is to come to you again. You're never weary of us praying to you. You're always open to us when our hearts are turned towards you. Thank you for drawing on our hearts. Thank you for filling our lives with joy today at the revelation of your character of love. May these seeds grow up in our souls 30, 60, 100 fold. And may we be able to take these thoughts and share them with our friends and family uh, and whoever we come in contact with that we can know that God is love. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So come and share with us. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to thank the Father so much for um, the messages he was giving to Brother Adrian to share with us today. Um, because I have been very blessed. Um, the character message is a message that I... I did not accept for a, a very long time, um, up until tonight, actually. I mean, today. Uh, and my husband knows because I've always <laughs> argued with him about it. Um, because I always, you know, reading the Bible, you, you'll read scripture where God says, you know, I will destroy, I will do this. And I just couldn't make the scriptures um, mesh, you know, with the character message. And so um, hearing his message today... Um, I can finally make scripture, understand the scripture in a new light and, and see how it meshes with the character of, of God. And so I really thank him for that. And because um, it also helps me to understand more. And I know that salvation isn't by works. Like there's nothing that we can do to be saved or um, nothing that we can do to save ourselves or make ourselves accepting in the sight of God. And this message also has affected my understanding of that because I'm more clearly seeing that there really isn't anything that we can do, you know, to save ourselves. And so I, I just praised God and I told him I was sitting in my seat, you know, just crying inside, like batting away my tears, you know, not trying to cry in my seat because it's like, it really is when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. And um, <laughs> yeah, I just rejoice in that and I just think, brother adrian so much for that message and that he has allowed god to speak to him and and share with the people so yeah thank you so thank much you. and praise god <laughs> you're just scratching the surface too you just watched one message <laughs> yeah. Yeah. just wait until you see everything else and read all of it you're crying on the outside. <laughs> uh, thank you sharina i really appreciate you sharing that it, it just makes it makes the journey worthwhile when you can see people uh, uh, respond and they can see it, that our Father really is love. And for, for many people, we've had this sense that uh, the Father is like Jesus. <laughs> but it's been so hard to prove from the Bible. Uh, and there's been many, I've had many concerns and uh, worried about presenting this. And it, uh, for myself... I know that in my position that I, I have a responsibility because uh, many people read my material and uh, I desperately don't want to lead people astray. I, I, I want to lead, I want what I share to be the truth and every man has faults and weaknesses and can be led astray very easily and I desperately uh, ask for your prayers that I continue to point people to Christ and in the right direction and uh, so, yeah, I, I agonized about this, as I did about the feasts. Is this right? Um, 
and uh, will, it, will it bring blessing or will it confuse people? And uh, so as someone who served in the church as a minister, I'm very mindful of of how it affects other people. And it's not just for myself, it's for other people as well. And I, I, don't, I, I don't want people to come up and say, well, I, I read what you said and I was affected by it and now I'm lost because of what you taught me. I, I, I desperately don't want to do that. Uh, and I feel that responsibility. So you know, I thank you for, for continuing to pray because there's a lot of winds of doctrine. There's a lot of stuff. Once people break free of a creed mindset, it's game on. I mean, it's people going everywhere. Uh, and a lot of us have been tossed around in the barrel, and some have gone over Niagara Falls uh, in that tossing around. And so, um, and it's hard because you can be very close with some people at one moment, and next minute, bang, you've just, you've just, I've just lost so many friends that I've gone numb. Uh, and uh, I know many of you are in the same, in the same situation. So uh, there's just one thing I wanted to share, and it's, it's really in the book, The Living Bread uh, from Heaven. It's the most recent book that we put together in Germany. I just wanted to make sure that we understood the principle of the meat offering, the amount of flour and oil that is attached to each sacrifice. Uh, has, are you... Have you all heard this principle? I don't want to go over it again if you've all heard it. So you haven't heard it? Okay. I touched on it a little bit. But this is just something very exciting in, in the scripture. I just want to share just this point. Let's take, let's take uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes. But come to Numbers 28. And we, we see, based on John chapter 6... Uh, and uh, maybe before we go to Numbers 28, come to John chapter 6, because this is interesting. What's really interesting about John 5, 6, and 7 is that it's, all of these chapters are connected to appointed times, uh, which many of you will already know. But it's the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus uh, is, is doing this miracle. It's just this interesting little footnote. And again, why is John making this comment in verse 4 of chapter 6? And the, Paso, uh, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Why does he make this comment? Uh, and then it goes on. Of course, in the Passover, they're going to be eating unleavened bread. So Jesus is wanting them to understand what this symbol of unleavened bread points to. And so he works this miracle of feeding the 5,000 and then he gets into a discussion with them about who really is the bread. And we, so we see again and again, I am the bread that come down from heaven. I am the living bread. And he keeps saying this over and over again. Your fathers ate bread in the wilderness and are dead because they ate it without faith. There is no life in and of the bread. And, and this is just a thought we need to keep in mind that, you know, the food that we eat, the food that we eat is not what keeps us alive. If the food that we ate kept us alive, we would never die. But we still die. So the food doesn't keep us alive. God keeps us alive through the channel of the food. Every loaf of bread is stamped with the cross of Christ. It's the power of Christ that makes the seed grow. We just put it in the, in the ground and it grows, but it's the power of Jesus Christ that makes it grow. And so every meal points to us of the sacrifice of Christ. And so he's, he's making this principle uh, clear in John chapter 6. So when he says, I am the bread, he's pointing us to all of the sacrificial system back in Numbers chapter 28. So when we read, if we come back over to Numbers chapter 28, because you have to ask yourself a question. Have you ever, tr have you ever tried to work out the measurements of the, the flour and oil that are connected to the sacrifices and wondered what on earth this has to do with the gospel. Uh, we come to verse uh, 3 of Numbers 28. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord, two lambs of the first year without spot, Day by day for a continual burnt offering. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, that's the morning sacrifice, uh, at the third hour of the day, and the other lamb shall be offered at even, and a tenth part of an ephah of flour. 
What's a tenth part of an ether, ether a flower? Well, in my part of the world, we operate in metric, so that's about 1.2 kilos, or so about 2.5 pounds of flour. 2.2 pounds per kilo, approximately. Uh, so in the morning, you've got uh, about 2.5 pounds of, of flour, or 1.2 kilos, and you have about a quart of oil, where it says uh, a fourth part of a hint of beaten oil. It's about a quart, or what we would say just under a litre. It is a continual burnt offering which was ordained in Mount Sinai for a sweet savour of sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. So with the offering of the lamb, there is then also the bread, uh, because they're mix you're mixing the oil with the flour which creates an unleavened bread and it is put on the altar of sacrifice and the priests will then eat from this bread, and the priests and their families will eat from this bread. There's also the, uh, the drink offering, verse 7. And what's interesting about this, the drink offering, therefore, shall be a fourth part of a hin for one lamb in the holy place shalt thou cause, and it says, strong wine to be poured unto the Lord. Now that word strong wine is a bad translation, and I wrestled with this because, we, you know, the un you've got unleavened bread, and then you've got, which is unfermented, and then you've got fermented wine. It just doesn't work. The, the actual meaning of the word here is preferred wine. And what was the preferred wine in John chapter 2? The wine that Jesus made? It was pure. It was unfermented. It was the choicest uh, grape juice that was available. And this was offered as a, as a drink offering. So you've got the wine and the unleavened bread being offered every day. Uh, and uh, this is what's happening morning and evening. So then in verse 9, And on the Sabbath day, two lambs of the first year without spot, two tenth deals of flour uh, for a meat offering mingled with oil and the drink offering thereof. This is the burnt offering uh, of every Sabbath besides the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. So on the Sabbath, you are doubling the flour and the oil. So it's 2.4 kilos of flour on the, on, for each day it's a total of 2.4 kilos of flour and 1.8 litres of oil every day. But then on the Sabbath, this is doubled. So you're getting double the amount of bread and double the amount of the drink offering. If Jesus is the bread of life, this, the symbolism here is that there is a doubling of the Spirit of Christ that's coming on the Sabbath. Do you, you, you see Otherwise, what does this mean? Have you ever asked yourself, what does it mean, all these measurements? Well, we just have got to keep the Israelites busy until Jesus comes the first time. No, that's not what it's saying. It's teaching us the gospel. I am the living bread. And we experience that spirit today. I mean, yesterday when I was presenting, maybe I was still getting over jet lag, but I got pretty tired. Today, I didn't feel tired. <laughs> Double the amount of the spirit. So, verse 11. And in the beginning of your months... You shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without spot. So now we've got two bullocks, one ram, and seven lambs being offered. This is a tremendous sacrifice on the part of Christ in order to give us the living bread. So what is the symbolism? We read in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and onwards, it says that the unrighteous suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Every day, the Spirit of Christ is poured out and is reaching into human minds. And human minds are pushing away the Spirit of Christ and acting in sinful ways which torture Christ. We know this ourselves. Every time you reach out to someone you love, and you try and speak to them about the truth, and they push you away. It hurts you terribly. And so you're tempted to stop trying because you don't want to be hurt anymore. Jesus doesn't stop trying. He keeps trying every day, reaching out. He makes himself vulnerable. He opens up his heart. He sends his spirit, and he gets rejected, despised, rejected, pushed back. And that's the sacrifice that he makes in order to send out this spirit that flows out of the throne of his father. He faces this scorn and rejection every day. Do you see the beauty of the cross? The cross of 2,000 years ago is a channel into an understanding of what the suffering of Christ is really about. 
The suffering of Christ, the six hours of Jesus on the cross represents 6,000 years of suffering. As the Spirit of Prophecy says, daily he suffers the agonies of crucifixion. And it has to be this way, brothers and sisters, that for grace to be offered to Adam, to Abel, to Seth, there had to be a sacrifice that was being offered back then in order for grace to be made available. And this is, Christ was being rejected and pushed back by Adam and Eve and Cain in their natural state. They were pushing. The carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God, but Jesus continually reached out to them. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And in the spirit, in the old nature, Adam is pushing him back. Pushing him back. And this is the sacrifice represented by the lamb and by the bullocks and the rams, etc., in order for living bread to be given. And when I, when I began to understand, I thought, I thought, this is just so beautiful. It's so beautiful that Christ does this. So in verse 12, And three-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil for one bullock. Three-tenth deal for, for one bullock. Two-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with an oil for a ram. And a several-tenth deal. That's one-tenth for each ram. When you put all that together... That's about 20 kilos of flour, or about 50 pounds. So you, you're getting, you're getting 2.4 kilos each day, you're getting nearly 5 kilos on the Sabbath, and then you're getting 20 kilos on the new moon. 20 kilos of bread. The living bread is coming down. Do, do you see the, the implications of this? How that... It's is coming out. But once you enter into the Sabbath principle that the Sabbath is a doubling up of the spirit, once you accept this principle, you then can open yourself up to this continuing to expand out into the new moon so that you're receiving the 20 kilos of flour. So when you're coming into the seventh day Sabbath, as we have done today, when you are reading this passage, I invite you by faith to believe that there is a doubling of the spirit on the Sabbath day. This is an act of faith. It's righteousness by faith that you believe the Spirit is being doubled up on the Sabbath. There's no works involved in this at all. It's simply that you open your heart and believe that Christ will come to you, will teach you, will bless you, and strengthen you. Isn't that righteousness by faith? It's a simple principle. But then what about on the new moon? Do you want to believe what this is actually saying, that's written. Remember that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with a light on his face. Do you know what Patriarchs and Prophets says the light on his face was? It was the light that shines from Calvary. Moses understood the cross. He understood the principle. This is Calvary at Sinai. And so, at the time of the new moon, a new moon is in a few days. So I invite you to test the principle. It's not, it's not too far away. And whatever calculation, and maybe you, we'll ask a question about how to calculate these things. Many people say, how do we do it? How do we do it? How do we do it? The first thing is to accept the principle. And at first, don't be too particular about the details. Don't get caught up in the detail. Accept the principle. As I have done this and, and uh, said, okay, this is the best I understand. I'm going to... Uh, remember the new moon at this particular time. And I've been tremendously blessed because I'm just like a little kid trying to work it out. Does my father in heaven go wrong and knock? No, he goes, come, come, come. I'll bless you. That's my father. That's how he operates. And so in a couple of days, I'm looking forward to 20 kilos of flour. Anyone want to celebrate with me? (laughs) Because that's what it's saying here. And many, many times I've experienced tremendous blessing. Now, I just want to let you into a little, uh, a little bit more of experiential side of things. I went back and I did some checking. And uh, my wife and I got married on a new moon. No wonder it was such a good day. <laughs> it was tremendous. And, uh, <laughs> interesting event. What does it say? Ezekiel 46, verse 1. What does it tell us? Let's have a look. 
Ezekiel chapter 46. We're entering into the third temple. Or the fourth temple. Thus saith the Lord, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the, new, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. Yeah, first verse. It reminds me of the 1980 Olympics uh, when they had it in Moscow. For those of you who remember. And when the Russian athlete would step up to throw the javelin, they would open the great doors of the stadium. Why did they do that? Because the air comes in and lifts the javelin and just sends it. And who won the gold medal? Russia. And when everybody else stood up, boom, they shut the doors. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Interesting history, isn't it? But what's the principle? When, when the gate is open, access. There is greater flow in the spirit that's occurring at that particular time. This is what it's saying. It is closed the sixth working day, opens the Sabbath, opens the new moon. Do you want it? Do you believe it? By faith. You see? So, the new moon uh, is a blessing. And as we are told, from one new moon to, to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come and worship before me, saith the Lord. So, and here's the principle. If you enter into a belief that on the Sabbath you are getting a doubling up of the Spirit of God, and you're having such a tremendous time, and somebody comes uh, uh, along and says, would you like more of this? What are you going to say? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm full. <laughs> I don't need any more of this. What are you going to say? No, yeah, I want more. Give me more. I'm hungry. That's the principle. But if, if your Sabbath keeping experience is dry, if it's something you must do in order to be saved, if it's something that you endure for the sake of uh, God requires it, and then someone comes along and says, do you want more of this? Like, oh, no. I'm doing enough. I've heard people say this. Oh, I'm already keeping one day a week. I mean, wow. More? <laughs> it's like, so what do you see? Do you, do you, this, is the, this is the principle. This is the test of, of the feast. And what's interesting is that when you add up the number of special days where the blessing comes, um, with the seventh day Sabbath, you get 52 days a year. But when you include all of the other appointments, it goes out to 80. So did Satan with, a third, with his tail take a third of the Sabbaths away from us? A third of them get knocked out when you take away the extra ones. Do you want that third taken away from you? I don't. I want 80. I don't want 52. Oh, 52 is good, but I want more. <laughs> Because it's the spirit of Jesus. It's, it's I get to feel closer to my father. And I want to feel close to him as much as I can. I want to follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's how I want to operate. And this is what he's uh, offering to me. And so in reference to the new moon, um, the woman of Revelation 12, what is she standing on? The moon. moon. Why? Well, as it says in Psalms 104, verse 19, he's appointed the moon for Moedim. He's appointed them for feast. The woman knows the timing of her husband. She knows when he comes. She's ready for him. And so in the appointments, we have the, the readiness for the second coming. And so I find myself now, I'm constantly anticipation. I'm waiting for the Sabbath. Oh, and then there's a new moon. Oh, and then Passover. And oh, Feast of Tabernacles. I'm always looking forward to the next appointment when the Spirit is going to be coming. And the Sabbath is so much more enjoyable. Like last night, I'm thinking, oh yeah, double the amount of Spirit coming. Thank you, Father. What a blessing. Maybe it affected my preaching. Because uh, I enjoyed myself today. It was really, it was really, really good. So... Then we see in, uh, we come down to verse 17 of Numbers 28. And in the 15th day of, the, of the, this month is the, is the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. In the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no manner of servile work. 
But you shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without blemish. Verse 20, and their meat offering shall be flour mingled with oil, three-tenth deals uh, for a bullock, two for a ram, and one or several-tenths deal of flour for a lamb. This is exactly the same amounts of flour and oil as the new moon. But guess what? You get it seven days in a row. That's 140 kilos of flour. Man, that is a serious feast. And it's, it's there for God's people, if you want it. If you want it. And you can keep going with each of the, the sacrifices until you come down to uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's, notice verse 13. To get, just get a grip of this. And ye shall offer a burnt offering... Uh, this is 29.13, a sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savour of the Lord. Thirteen young bullocks, two rams and fourteen lambs of the first year shall they offer without blemish, with all their accompanying flour and oil. And then on the, tr- on the next day it's twelve bullocks, on the next day it's eleven bullocks, on the next day it's ten bullocks, and all the flour and oil. And I did all the calculations, that's 420 kilos of flour in the Feast of Tabernacles. There's nearly a thousand pounds of flour on the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you believe it? It's amazing. On the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, it's uh, two two point four plus two point four, so it's four point eight. This this time it's four hundred and twenty kilos. But it's a magnification principle. This is what we're talking about: the Sabbath fountain. As it's coming down, it's getting wider and wider and wider. And this is what we see in Ezekiel 47. What do we see coming out of the sanctuary? Remember um, Leviticus 26, reverence my sanctuary and keep my Sabbaths. And as the water is coming out of the sanctuary, have a look at Ezekiel 47. It says in verse 3, And when the man had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. He brought me through the waters. The water were to the ankles. So you, there's a water coming out of the sanctuary. And as he goes a thousand cubits, the water's up to his ankles. So it comes out of the sanctuary daily, goes out a thousand cubits, it's up to his ankles. And he measured a thousand cubits. Uh, uh, measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, the waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, were to the loins. So as you're going out of the sanctuary, the water's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And as you move through the feasts, the spirit is getting deeper and deeper and deeper as you go along. The great thing about is when you're in a moving current, when the water gets up to your waist, you're getting to the point where you're no longer deciding where you're going. The Spirit's deciding and leading you where it wants to take you. You you see that? And when it gets over your head, well, you're just doing backstroke. It's great. You're just in the Spirit. Isn't it a beautiful, beautiful system? Our Father just loves to give. He loves to pour things out upon us. So when we're in Germany, you know, I'm there, we're eating 420 kilos of flour. I mean, you've got to share it with someone. I mean, you can't eat all that stuff yourself. You've got to... We've got, to bring other, we've got to bring in the lame, we've got to bring in the sick, we've got to bring them all in to receive this blessing because it's like 420 kilos of flour. You, you see? That's why I love the feast. It's great. That's why I've understood the feast, especially tabernacles, to be an evangelistic event as well. Yeah. It's about evangelism, not so much about, you know, we do something to gather together or whatever. It's well, in both cases, if we gather together and have a tremendous blessing and then we go out... After that, we can do that or bring people in. And uh, what I'd like to do is run meetings during the day for the believers and then have an evangelistic program each night to bring the people in so they can have some of this food as well. And, and this, is, this is the point, and I'm glad Bill brought this up, is that in my mind, I operate in, on, the, on the pioneer platform of camp meetings and and evangelism, and this is the way that, that we operate in, in that context. I was thinking earlier, is there a way to take this and turn it into a, a way that the world can understand it? You know? Take this here? Yeah, all of this. Because, you know, you presented it so beautifully through our history. To 
put this in, in, into the way the world can understand it, yeah, apart from Adventist history? Well, let's work on it. Yeah, to take, to take this message to the world. The first thing is for us to understand it. <laughs> then, we can, then, we, then we can adapt it. So this is what I understand to be the living bread from heaven. And this is why I understand that, as, as it says in uh, Second Esdras, that God's people will be sealed in the feast. It, it's not a, a complex thing to understand. It's just, it's just it's not what we're used to. And when we wear Augustine's covenant glasses, we look at this, no, that's legalism. But the only reason it's legalism is because our Sabbath-keeping experience is legalism. And the feast is going to blow you out of the water if, if that's what, what you're doing. Now, the other, the other thing I will say in reference to this <coughs> is that the feasts are an expansion of the Sabbath. Okay, in port, it, it, So that we can get a principle of magnification, the Sabbath must stand above the feasts in order as the Father is greater than His Son, the Son magnifies the Father. But many people want to elevate the feasts and make them co-equal or one with the Sabbath. You do that, you destroy the magnification principle. Okay, so, and once you do that, you, uh, there's all kinds of problems. And my observation is the reason why many people are so af- aloof from feasts is because they get exposed to, well, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to wear this, and you can't wear this, and you can't eat that, and you can't do this. Well, that sounds very boring and dangerous. And, that's why, and, and the sad thing for me is that I don't mind people um, wanting to exp- experiment with some Judaism uh, and bringing in those aspects into it. But the problem is, is that many Adventists lose their Adventist identity uh, and go into Judaism and into Hebrew roots and into all of this kind of uh, uh, thing which... Is, is worrying to me because we and to me I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I stand on that platform and as Bill was saying that's these times are the best times to do evangelism because you've got a lot of bread on offer uh, and, and reaching out to people and uh, I, I have a lot of people say to me like well, well people saying I've got to do this and I can't eat this and I can't do that and I'm supposed to wear this and and I'm like you know, when people say to me, what do you do on the feast? I said, I get my surfboard and I ride. Because the Spirit's coming through in great measure. So, <laughs> so I want to ride that wave. I want to ride it into the shore. It's about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the emphasis, at least for me, as I understand it. So when I had someone come to me and say, you know, should we be eating leavened bread during the feast of unleavened bread? I said, ask your father. Don't talk to me. You do what you're convicted to do. I'm focused on receiving the spirit that's available at this particular time. It's an emphasis thing. You you see what I'm saying? You get hung up on all the detail and then there's big arguments and fights over, no, we don't do it at that time, we do it at this time. It's like you kill kill it completely. It's just just not the way to do it. So um, that's, that's what I understand is the living bread from heaven. I just wanted to share it with you. Uh, I hope that, uh, that that's, a, that's a blessing to you as, it, as it's been to me. Question? Do you have a quote for a second book of Adventist history? Do you have a quote of that? I'm going to write now. I just wanted to see what you find it. Um, second. Like, chapter, I think it's in chapter 2. Uh, 238. 238. Try me out. See how good my... Uh, it was early on. It's early in the in the book. Oh, so it's the first book. Second Esdras. Yeah, second Esdras equals eleven. Chapter two. Yeah, I figured that. For some reason, two thirty-eight is coming into my head. I could be completely wrong. Oh, I'm right. Arise up and stand. Behold the number of those that be sealed in the feast of the Lord. Uh, second is dress. Thanks, Ray. Oh, we're going to get people. Yes. Second is dress 238. 
So, looks like we're into questions. Bill's got, oh. Okay, so <clears throat> after being at a meeting not too long ago where this was a real issue over peacekeeping and just covenant understanding, I've been doing some, you know, earnest investigation of my own. And, um, and you know, being in ministry now, I've been reading Acts of the Apostles again, you know, because I figure if I want to lead people, I should go back and study the way the, the apostles were leading in the early church. So <clears throat> you come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. Are you, you're probably acquainted with that chapter where it talks about, you know, Acts 15, when they had the council and they come to the understanding that the Gentiles are abstained from fornication, yep. things offered to idols, strangled, blood, right? And no other burden is to be put up on the Gentile. And if you read in, um, but of course, it says, but they have Moses read in the synagogue every Sabbath. And hmm. I think that's a key in all of this as well. Of course. I just want to share my ideas just real briefly and then ask the question because I'm trying to, I'm trying to make the two reconcile. So, so then... <clears throat> You have to understand that in the early apostolic church, the Jews were not being told to put off their economy. Nobody was coming to them and saying, stop doing what you do as Jews. But at the same time, nobody was telling the Gentile, at least Paul was not, to do what the Jews were doing. So you have a mingling, right, of understanding. But they're all meeting in the synagogue. if they're Because yep. the, the moral law, she says in Acts of the Apostles, that Paul rigorously taught the moral law to the Gentiles. So there was a no way. So they would have had to be meeting on the Sabbath. So I'm trying to understand. So say the Gentile never decided to pick up that aspect of the Jewish economy, which would have been feast keeping, festivals. They call them festivals. You know, that's how the pioneers, were, or she would refer to it as festivals. They would never pick that up. There was no requirement for them to pick it up, but yet there was no requirement for them not to do it as well as Jews. So it's like, how do you bow? You understand what I'm saying? Do you understand the question I'm asking? Mm. I got into a conversation with a sister about this last week, and I'm like, well, and she's like, well, what about? Well, the Sabbath was given before there was ever sin. So you can't, it's no, it's no brainer. There's no question about the Sabbath. You, you say, well, because that was the way they came back. I mean, well, what do you do with the Sabbath? Because if you don't keep the feast, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. And I'm like, well, no, the Sabbath was given before the fall of man. So the Sabbath is bonnie, but the feast were something that was added as a plan of redemption. Does that make sense? I've yeah. heard that understanding. Yeah. I, I so, have a bit of a different understanding. But. Okay, well, that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'm not trying to yeah, know, yeah. No, that's, be confrontational. I'm just yeah, yeah. I'm wrestling yeah. with these things and yep. trying to understand myself. So, Good, good point. In reference to Acts chapter 15, the, uh, the, my, my emphasis on this, and I, I guess I can share it with you this way, because... Because the human spirit is so much desiring to ask this question, what must I do to be saved? We are so naturally desirous to find out what I have to do. What do I have to do? What do I have to do? There's such an emphasis on that, that coming into feast keeping with that mindset is very dangerous. And so like what we've done in Australia is, is uh, the first time we, we had a, a Passover... We only had evening meetings. We didn't even put together a camp because this is, they were still working and still at work. Uh, and I didn't say anything about stopping work or anything like that. I just said, let's just come in the evening. Let's just celebrate because I just want you to get a taste. I just want you to ride your surfboard just a little bit and get a feel for the spirit. And they had a wonderful time, just a blessing, just doing a meeting every night, just to, to give a taste. So it's how you present this. If I had to come along and say, well, if you're going to keep a feast, you're going to have to stop work, you're going to have to do this, you're going to have to do this. And then the, some people will go, uh, and then the other people will go, okay, all right, well, I'm, let's do it. Let's grind our teeth down and let's really get into it and do it. So uh, as far as the optional aspect is concerned, and this is something that I have done with on every subject of standards and Christian uh, living, I've said to people, do not embrace a reform until you see the freedom in it. Okay? Don't embrace the reform until you see the freedom in it. If you do it without seeing the freedom in it, you're in bondage. Mm -hmm. I've said this to, I've said this to, to people uh, when I've talked to them about jewellery. Do not embrace the reform until you see the freedom in it. If you do it for the wrong reason, you're in bondage. Mm -hmm. And you're longing to put the stuff back on because you're only doing it to gain merit with God. 
And this is the principle that I've operated on. But what I say to people is, in the appointed times, there is all this extra gift of the Holy Spirit that's available. The question is, do you want it? Well, you can say, well, no, I'm full. Okay, if you're full. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I need all of the Holy Spirit I can get. And so I would never say to anybody, you must do this in order to be saved because the human mind interprets that completely the wrong way. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're focusing on what we will do rather than receiving the Holy Spirit. So that's why I call myself a feast receiver. I'm receiving something. I, I, when people play with labels, uh, that's, that's a label I put on myself. I'm a feast receiver. I've come to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I haven't come to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I just want to receive the Spirit of Jesus. And so in reference to, uh, and I, I see your question, but in reference to the feast coming after the fall, we need to think carefully about this particular point because there's, there's a danger here that we say, well, we, we have to observe the Sabbath because it was before the fall. Uh, there's a danger of legalism in that argumentation, like I have to do it because it was before the fall. So... Uh, not that everyone does that, but the problem with this is that we could say, well, I have to honor the Father because he came first, but Jesus came after the Father, so he's not as important. There's, there's a problem with that, with that understanding. In my understanding, as Jesus inherited all the fullness of the Father's divinity, the feast inherit all the fullness of the Sabbath rest and magnifies it. And see, this is the principle. The feasts come after the Sabbath, but magnify the Sabbath. Jesus comes after the Father, but magnifies the Father. It's, a, it's the same principle that's operating there. And so when you read in Genesis 1.14, it says that God made the two great lights for days, for years, for Moedim. Now, when it makes reference to Moedim in Eden... Was, did they have seasons, like in physical seasons, before the, before the fall? So what are the Moedim being referred to? Well, it's spiritual Moedim that's being referred to. And so uh, I believe that those things existed before the fall. Uh, and that, you know, that God liked to have weekly gatherings, monthly gatherings, and yearly gatherings. It was... It was a, yeah, yeah. So... It's just an extension of that principle. And you can look in Genesis, Genesis chapter, and I've written an article on this on, on my website, when it says Cain and Abel, in process of time, they came up to sacrifice. And that word process of time means at the end of the year. And when you look at it more carefully, that, that this is re referring to a specific time that they were both gathering together to worship God. And it was a once in a year event. So there's a reference there to to some kind of gathering right there in Genesis chapter 4. So uh, there's, there's many other things that we could, we could look at uh, on this particular point. But um, the, the emphasis, the sad emphasis I have found with many in feast keeping is that uh, as soon as you get a bunch of things that you have to do, people love to shove it down other people's throats. Uh, and it, and, and it's just, it kills it. And that's why so many people are resisting the feast. As I have experienced, the biggest reason why people will not accept the Father and Son is anti-Trinitarianism. That's the greatest reason why people don't accept it. Because they look at the, the bashing, debating, aggressive spirit of anti-Trinitarians and they go, oh. And it's the same with feast keeping. The greatest reason not to be a feast keeper is to look at feast keepers. Because of the, 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 the emphasis on Hebraism, the emphasis on rules and regulations, the emphasis on doing all things Jewish, uh, a lot of people go, uh, I don't, want to, I don't want a part of that. So in my experience, I'm trying to offer an Adventist culture connecting itself to feastkeeping. And uh, I, I trust that we'll win that battle. But uh, <laughs> So long answer to a short question. So Just... Similar question in you know, uh, Colossians 2.16 on this subject. Colossians 2.16? Yeah. I, I have a pamphlet on that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I just think, you know, what, what you are saying here, let no one uh, judge you. Yeah. What you eat or drink, you know, on those days. Isn't that what it is? I, my understanding of Colossians 2.16 is that when you read uh, this chapter in context, 
um, it's basically talking about the proto-Gnostic Christians who were judging Christians who were eating and drinking during their worship time. And uh, that Paul was saying to them, don't let them judge you when you're having your new moons, feasts and Sabbaths. Don't let them judge you when you participate in this. So, but I think the principle is, as you say, it's pretty clear that um, we're not to judge one another on these particular issues. We're just to do the best of our conscience as what we understand the Bible is teaching. So. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a proto-Gnostic... <laughs> it's a proto-Gnostic teaching. It was before, Gnosticism came around about 100 AD, but this was the, the preliminary part of that coming out of the dualistic Greek culture. And that's where it's saying that spiritual is good and material is evil. And so food is material. Food is evil. So when they would have the bread and the wine, it's material forms of worship... And the, the Gnostics were saying, we can't have this at our gatherings. That's evil. And Paul is saying, don't let them judge you in this. Okay, others try and say that it's an emphasis on Judaism. And maybe uh, there's an also a reference there to Judaism in terms of the Jews saying, well, it has to be done a certain way and you still have to kill this animal. And you... No, don't let anyone judge you in, in these things. So, any other questions? We're all done.